From the heartland of the United States and one of the leading children's medical centers in the world, welcome to the Children's Mercy Kansas City Pediatric Bioethics Webinar Series. We invite international leaders to discuss critical and controversial issues in bioethics. Now, from the Bioethics Conference Center on the Adele Hall campus, here's Dr. John Lantos. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the uh, Bioethics Center. Uh, we are broadcasting live from Crown Center in Kansas City, where the annual meeting of the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities is taking place. As usual, we are coming to you from the top of the Bioethics Tower here in Crown Center, and we have a great group of people here today to talk about shared decision making in pediatrics. Before I introduce our panel, let me just say if any of you are in Kansas City at the ASBH meeting, we are going to have a reception tomorrow evening from 5.30 to 7.30 at the Milano restaurant in Crown Center. Stop by, say hi, have a drink, we'd love to see you. We have some great upcoming webinars. On October 30th, Dom Wilkinson is going to come and talk to us a little bit about the Charlie Gard case. Dom is a neonatologist and philosopher at Oxford and was involved in some of the decision making for Charlie. On November 13th, Jenny Leinbarger, who runs our pediatric palliative care service here at Children's Mercy, will be talking about living or surviving. Those are both uh, uh, webinars that we invite you to tune into. For those of you who want to get more bioethics, we have a certificate program. Application deadlines November, uh, December 15th. Get those applications in. There's a special program for nurses who want to develop leadership skills in bioethics and a scholarship program for students from developing countries. We also have a one-year on-site fellowship program here. For the webinar, the panel is going to talk for about 30, 35 minutes about shared decision making. If you have questions or comments, there's two ways to send those to us. One, you could type them in that little chat room, uh, chat box at the lower right hand corner of your screen, or you could tweet us at hashtag CMBioethics, Children's Mercy Bioethics, and we will read out your comments. Let me briefly introduce our panel. These people all spoke at uh, the conference that we had here yesterday about shared decision making. And we're going to summarize that and talk about some of the uh, uh, interesting issues that came up. Wynne Morrison is uh, a pediatrician, palliative care doctor, and pediatric intensivist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Vanessa Madrigal trained at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, but now has moved down to Washington, D.C and does critical care and palliative care at Children's National Medical Center. Jody Halpern, who has laryngitis and is going to try to talk uh, anyway, but if you can't hear her, let us know. Type that in the chat box. But she gets her own microphone. Um, she is a psychiatrist and philosopher at the School of Public Health, University of California, Berkeley. Go Bears. And Chris <laughs> Futner is uh, a pediatrician, not an intensivist, but does uh, ethics and palliative care and the care of children with chronic disease at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So thank you all for coming yesterday and today. Let me start by just throwing out a question for you all. We spent uh, the day yesterday hearing talks by you all and a few other people about this complicated and somewhat ambiguous concept of shared decision making. Do you think we made any progress? Uh, do we know more what shared decision making is? What did we learn? Take um, a win. I, okay. <laughs> I, I think I was, I was, it was very interesting to see how much interest there was in the topic, even though I agree with you that there was not necessarily agreement on exactly what it is. And that was part of what was interesting. There was a lot of debate with people's responses ranging from we shouldn't be doing this at all or calling it shared to others saying, well, shared can encompass everything we do. And I'm, I'm not sure we necessarily came to agreement, but we got many interesting perspectives from different directions. Anybody else? I think there's a general consensus that ranging from fairly straightforward decisions, but particularly as the decisions become more weighty and difficult, that there's a lot going on that we're using this word decision making to cover. Everything from potentially understanding what the entire situation is and 
where the threats are, where the danger is, um, all the way through to trying to figure out how one incorporates, clarifies and incorporates values, beliefs, preferences into whatever this decision is going to be. Uh, and then the difficulties of potentially enacting them, of actually being able to carry out a plan uh, that there's a lot going on there. So part of the confusion is how do we talk about all the different things that we just lump together and say it's decision making. And I think the other struggle is when we talk about sharing, it sounds like a lovely thing. Um, but usually it's a thing. If we're going to share this bottle of water, I might take a sip. You have laryngitis, so I probably wouldn't take a sip after you. <laughs> um, decisions are not quite like that. Uh, they're not a thing. Uh, it would be more like a conversation where I might give you some of my perspective, you would give me some of your perspective, we would sort of take turns. Um, but if you think about what decision making entails from information exchange and preferences to who's going to actually have control of the decision, are you going to have it, am I going to have it, and then who wears the, uh, the mantle of the weight of responsibility, is it on my side, the doctor's side, is it on the patient's side, all of those you're asking a lot of two phrases, shared and decision-making, to encompass all of that and have clarity. We definitely need more work to do in it. A lot of people are clear on that, exactly how we're going to move it forward without clarifying it. That's, I think, what became clear to me, greater clarity and probably dividing some of these tasks into different things that we study and figure out how to improve. Vanessa? Well, I... I was interested to see how many like-minded people were sitting in the room and how comfortable we seem to be with ambiguity mm. and with kind of the gray area that we many times find ourselves in with, um, with some of these families um, and how um, there, there's, there was a lot of discussion about kind of how we eventually arrive at maybe a, 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 an actual decision and how that path to getting there is very tortuous and, um, and and is more of, of a journey instead of looking for, and, and, and the, the room seemed to be more comfortable with that and expressed some kind of uh, anxiety about how do then, do we translate this and digest this in a way that, um, that we can bring our colleagues on board. Yeah. Jody, give it a try. <laughs> can you hear me? Folks, I, I think so. Yep. Yeah. Great. I think I would love a term like scaffolded decision making. Scaffolded. Um, because to me, the main responsibility that is, I mean, why do anything different? What are doctors not doing right, right now? What's not going well right now is that when a patient is being told of a terrible diagnosis, a tragic choice, it's like a, a nuclear bomb going off and they're panicked and the family's panicked. And doctors act like it's time to go into a very rational information dump, whereas they have an immediate responsibility to address the emotions in the room in a way that they're really not doing so far. And that once they do that and create safety, to me it's the creation of safety so that patients and families can deliberate and then the doctor's continued role in that may involve helping identify some of the issues they haven't already thought about, but first and foremost is creating that safety by the doctor, recognizing their role in that emotional support. So the, those of you who do this for a living, do, is, that, is that the problem, that we don't recognize, acknowledge, or deal with parents or patients' emotions and instead rush towards an attempt at a conclusion? I, I think it's a real risk mm -hmm. that our our pace of where we want to come to the next steps may be much faster than is tolerable for a patient or family, and that um, we have to be really careful we don't get so caught up in how are the decisions going to be made or how do I prevent a bad decision from being made that we forget to support the family. In so going you, through a really hard time. How do you do that? How do you know in your own work with families? Go ahead. <laughs> um, 
and we've we've talked about there's many times you have to approach it from the human connection perspective sit down with um uh, sit down with them and really kind of get to know when people talk about getting to know their their values and getting to know their preferences and um and and those are beautiful but how do you get to actually do that and um one of one of the terms we brought up and there's many different terms of it uh, is synchrony and in, in, in feeling how um what the what kind of the rhythm letting them lead it a lot of active listening um a lot of empathy uh, a lot of um curiosity i loved you brought that up and that's a really fantastic way of looking at it um asking more questions really not just open-ended questions um uh that that try to get at your own goal and agenda but um how what tell me about you today tell me about your child today and how that really just opens the door and if you give it give the family space and time that um you may be able to learn with them and and possibly sync with them um uh someone came up to me afterwards and in and, and showed distress that, though that you're not going to be able to do this with every family mm. um or that they may get um fatigued by so many people trying to um reach them at that level and i think that those are certainly valid concerns but um but i think that families really when they sense that you care about them as individuals about their children as individuals and valued uh people and a valued human being that they can really sense that and they um um they warmly accept it when they're in in that moment of tragedy i i might take a slightly different tact on the question you're asking john of not just how should we do it or how do we do it but also what is ethics potentially telling us we ought to be doing um you know the main burden of any decision is going to be with the parents and the child that because of the commitment the the stake that they have that their challenges are huge but i think there's another side to this is the challenges of people like myself clinicians or also the paraprofessionals the other people on the interdisciplinary team uh, what are the rules that we have that we're allowed to engage people uh, and i think i often say ethics is both a force for good but potentially it, it raises problems um where i think people have gotten the message that i as a physician am only allowed if i'm going to respect your autonomy to give you facts and i need to give you lots of facts i need to be very very clear and i'm going to need utter clarity about what you want me to do otherwise i'm somehow acting ethically inappropriately and one of the issues i think that came out yesterday is that that is a very rigid model it's a very limited model um some of the issues jody that you talked about with full voice um not being able to uh really think about how you uh create a, a context of safety of the synchrony that Vanessa you're talking about where is all of that work as part of the ethical mandate of what you're supposed to do to support decision making i wind up counseling a lot of the folks that i work with on the physician side and also on nursing even chaplaincy about where are they allowed to go before they are starting to somehow transgress the autonomy boundary of letting people be on their own i think most of the parents that i work with they want transparency they want us to be forthright about what our motives or intentions are but they also want a human dialogue about what is going on not all of them some of them do want just the facts thank you nothing more but many want more and i think that's part of what this shared concept is there to sort of take the pendulum that swung too far in one direction and move it back more to a center of a human dialogue about confronting tremendous adversity and and how do i do that so you think in some ways bioethics has overreacted against traditional paternalism and left us it's with an excess of autonomy uh ex uh maybe it's not just the autonomy I think that there's also medical legal issues that have people worried about what they're allowed to do what might be uh potentially 
you know, a, a wrist slap of, of having actually gone too far to try to reassure people or get into the world that they are with their curiosity uh, experiencing emotionally. I think it has gone to a point where wittingly or unwittingly, there are reasons to not go back to the old days of paternalism, which I'll also say wasn't just about the doctor knew what was the right thing to do. The doctor often wouldn't even tell you there was a secretiveness about it that I think is anathema. But part of this work now is to say, how do I bring, if parents want it, the uh, experience that I have, the various ways I've seen these things play out, how can I bring that kind of knowledge uh, along with some recommendations as to how they may want to think about things, not prescriptive that they have to, but here's some suggestions. Can I bring that back into the dialogue and not be accused of becoming paternalistic and I'm doing something wrong? Similar experience? I mean, do, does bioethics help you do this work or does it get in the way? <laughs> I, I hear a frequent concerns, especially in the critical care community about, you know, we've gone, we've swung the pendulum too far and there's too much um, deference to autonomy. But I think, I guess what I would say with that is I think it's absolutely essential to the process that the patient and family be included in the process. How much that means they own that entire decision themselves, it, 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 being included in the process doesn't mean that they should or will take on the full burdens of that decision themselves. We may need, and one of the best ways we may be able to help a family is to be able to guide them, mm -hmm. give them a strong recommendation, especially when we think there's one path that might be clearly better than another, but allow also that we will listen to them and what is important to them, and that that's a starting point. And so, so we yeah. want a sort of inclusive, transparent, Parent, attentive paternalism. Yes, and I actually in our paper <laughs> in our paper we said parentalism rather than paternalism oh, because it is not just men who can My be bad. dictatorial. <laughs> <laughs> Maternalism, parentalism. Parentalism. <laughs> but, but I think again we're using even the word paternalism is loaded. Right. Um, if we said instead it's about bringing back some of the experiential judgment. Um, which may be, mis may be inaccurate. Uh, I think we have to be humble about what we're offering, but it's a uh, set of recommendations or guidance that's based on not just esoteric book knowledge or knowledge of the genome, but knowledge of how things tend to play out in clinical practice, some of the difficulties that are encountered. And I'll also point out that the word autonomy is being used in a very restricted sense of, I I'm being told, actually, it's not autonomy, because if I have true autonomy, I ought to be able to delegate. I ought to be able to hire you as a consultant and say, hey, come here. I have never dealt with this problem before. What would you do mm -hmm. if you were in my shoes? I ought to be able to ask for that. And if I'm treated with autonomy, that request should be respected. That's been ruled sort of out of bounds. And I think it's a very interesting particular definition of autonomy that goes beyond self-rule. It goes to isolationism. And that's partially why this metaphor sharing, I think, is uh, potent, even if it's not fully fleshed out, because it says you're not alone in this, unless you truly, truly want to be. And then that's another scenario. But most people, that's not the extremes. I mean, you've done work studying how parents, where they want to be on that continuum. Um, yes, absolutely. So I, I mean, I think every parent is going to be a little bit different, and they may be different in different times of the child's illness. And um, one of the one of the criticisms that, um, that that I received yesterday when I'm talking about kind of this this open curiosity and and, and, and showing empathy and, um, and and addressing emotion is um, is that that's great and that makes everybody feel good or maybe even it helps shed some tears but where does that really get you in terms of how does um how does it help make a particular decision and um one of one of the things you notice i think of, of, of a family that i took care of recently um that uh had been in the system for a very long time she had had a lot of um problems from the time she was born it was about eight years of age so really been in the system for a very long time, and um, I'm not sure that the family would have responded 
very well to someone coming to them and saying, well, this is what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting in the sitting down and opening up the door to the curiosity and to the empathy and, and trying to just figure out what um, what is she like? What is she like now? Um, what what are what so are so that was your first approach when you came in as the new doc for this patient who had been seeing yes. probably hundreds of doctors. Hundreds of doctors. Um, she uh, had a neurologic event along the way, and the family really felt that kind of um, with the neurologic injury that people then really started to dismiss them and not value her as a as a human being and they 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 started to develop this lack of trust and they were both very very angry kind of when when she came in very critically ill to mm -hmm. the to the unit um but in conversations with them you realize that parents can simultaneously have these emotions of, of distrust and putting up the walls and my child is fine and there's going to be a miracle and she's going to go home and she can and they can simultaneously also say and realize and understand and verbalize um, she's not doing well this is the how worst much, I've ever seen her before. how much time did you have to spend with them to so that's funny that didn't come up yesterday did it <laughs> that, I, I, I would hear a lot of my colleagues say well I don't I just don't have the time to, to do that and, um, and I would argue I mean I, I've learned much from the some of the people sitting in this room, it doesn't always take as long as you think it might. Um, but sitting down and uh, attending to that person in a very genuine way, even if it's just for a few minutes, the, the families, and I think there have been some studies that have actually looked at this, that families will say, that person spent a lot of time with me, where um, can, uh, you know, actually qualitative, uh, quantitatively speaking, they, they spent either just as much time or, or even less than the other one did, um, but the, the interaction was more meaningful and so it, it, it stuck with them more. Um, it certainly takes time, I don't want to um, downplay that. You actually sat down, huh? <laughs> May have done that, yeah. <laughs> you think that was important? And We're running into them in the hallway and, and continuing <laughs> conversation. Uh, we're going to keep talking, but if you have comments you can or questions for the panel, you can type them into that chat room in the lower right-hand corner of your screen or tweet to hashtag CMBioethics, and we will read out your question to these national experts. Jody, go ahead. Put it, <clears throat> putting together all the things that people just said, it seems to me that one of the places where, oops, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Putting together, I think that we think if, if there's any kind of experiential judgment that physicians who deal with these issues a lot have to bring to the table, that judgment should first and foremost be used for them to be aware of their own emotional reactions and not go into the room where they're communicating immediately an agenda to the patient and family that makes them feel rushed, pressured, afraid to express anger, afraid to express disappointment. They've got to feel, you talk about it doesn't take that much time, but it takes a sense that there's an emotional space and openness within the physician. They need some space. Without feeling that, you can't create the safety for the communication you all want to have. So, Chris, if you, if you had been called to see this child who had been in and out of the system for eight years and the sign-out was the parents are angry and distrustful and the child had just had a devastating neurologic event and you were going to go meet them and introduce yourself and try to build a trusting relationship, how would you start? Well, I think what Jody just said is exactly right, that, you know, the first challenge that before I even walk into the room is take my own internal temperature and uh, how tired am I, how uh, rushed do I feel, how jacked up I am, am I be based on potentially what people have said to me. And I purposefully go through a routine of just calming myself and setting my intention, uh, which I mean quite specifically, what am I going to try to do when I walk into that room? And I can tell you for years, my main mantra to myself is just connect. Hmm. Uh, I go in with very little agenda. Uh, 
unless it's a medical crisis where we need to move very quickly to prevent something bad from happening, I manage my sense of time. Okay, I have time for a day or two to get to know this child, get to know this family. And all I'm trying to do is to go into the room and see where they are and connect with them. Uh, and then things will often ensue after that connection has occurred. But I agree entirely with Vanessa that the uh, complaint that I hear repeatedly is I don't have time. And what I think it's a mixture of is I also don't have the energy and the attentiveness. I'm just spread a little bit too thin. I've got too many parallel things, balls in the air. So I have to put all of that in my own mind aside and basically go in and be completely with you. Uh, so do and you do probably, this as a conscious, like you stop outside the room or in the stairwell and yes, take a deep breath? And yes. So uh, we're talking about practice now, but yeah. uh, I practiced when I was in high school how to take foul shots where you have to step up to a line there's pressure, everybody's staring at you. Oh my gosh, I'm getting off with clamped right now. <laughs> of how to actually calm myself so that I could go through a fairly ritualized motor pattern to try to put a ball in a net 10 feet above the ground, 15 feet away. And I learned then that if I could get myself calmer, I could actually do the subsequent behavior that I was hoping to do successfully. I could just do it in a more reliable, highly reliable way. So I learned then that there is a value of actually, yes, the five seconds that it takes. And it has to be, for me, it is something I practice. Mm -hmm. But that allows me to walk into the room. And I'm not perfect. There are days where I just walk in the room and I'm like, bah! Um, <laughs> but even then, I may realize after a minute, like, oh, I messed up. I need to actually go back to that little place of just calming. And then tell me what's going on. You know, I, yeah, you do I'd, similar things? I, I don't have a ritual before walking into the room, but I absolutely can see the value of that. I think the, I'm going to come back to the word curiosity that's been mentioned a couple of times. I think I try to remind myself to do that. And I remember once going into a room of, to talk to the parents of a child who was born with a genetic condition, had had many chronic medical problems her whole life, was now intubated in the ICU, and they were at the point of needing to make a decision about whether we were going to compassionately extubate the child with an anticipation that she would likely die right. or not. And the critical care fellow walked in with me to, which is, you know, the trainee should really make a habit of trying to join for as many of these conversations as they possibly can. So she came in with me. And when my first question to the family was, tell me a, what life is like for her at home rather than, well, we're faced with this decision now today, mm -hmm. what do you think about stopping? And they talked for a few minutes, not long, and we had so much more insight about that child and that family and where they were starting from and making these decisions that as we left the room, she said, I never learned to do that. No one ever told me that, mm -hmm. to just start with an open-ended question. And were you and surprised by what they told you about her life at home? I was, yeah, because I had cared for her in the ICU and I had not that great insight into what life was like for her when she was well. Yeah. And I think that's frequently the case. And the things that she enjoyed at home and what a valuable family member she was in this family. And, yeah. and I, you know, I could have philosophically, of course, you know, reminded myself of those things. Mm -hmm. But having those stories from the family in front of me and feeling their emotion made so much of a difference in both how I supported them through that decision and also the, the other thing Chris has talked about a lot is, you know, how do you, how do you help the families make it through this whole process with integrity, with integrity in their role as parent or sibling or child of the patient with, you know, integrity in what they see as what it takes to be that good parent. And mm -hmm. Chris, that's, that's. Yeah, I mean, the, the concept of what a parent feels on the inside they need to do to be a good parent, which really emanates with work that Pam Hines has done and in sort of parallel way, I've been thinking for a long time about the conversations I'd have with parents where they are trying to figure out what it means to be a loving, caring, nurturing parent to a child who's very, very ill. Um, 
they walk around like all parents do with a sense of what they should be doing, what they ought to be doing. Self-defined. Um, I don't think I, we have to justify these beliefs. They are the living reality of how people feel. And against those standards or rules that come out of that sense of duty, they're looking at options and making determinations. Is that a type of an action that a loving parent or a good parent would do in my own terms? And they make judgments about themselves. You know, the old notion that we have that every parent feels guilty at some level um, because they're not quite living up to what they ought to do um, to the degree that that is true. And often you talk to parents and they do have pangs of regret or, or guilt or intense sadness because they haven't been able to get done what they want to do. Are we willing to talk with them if they want about what those beliefs, those feelings that they have about what they ought to do? Because I find often much of what they are struggling with is how to reconcile what they think they ought to be doing with the reality that is rushing at them. Um, many parents do come to a way of actually figuring this out on their own, but many welcome the opportunity to just in a safe place, uh, safe harbor, be able to talk about, I, I have these two notions and they seem to be conflicting. How can a good parent both want my child, I want my child to be in pain, but I also want my child to live as long as possible. Help me, like, this isn't fair, both to the child or to me as a parent who wants to be loving. I don't know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. A couple of questions online also could take questions from the studio audience here, if you find a microphone. Let's do yeah, we've got some online questions coming in. The first one asks, what about the role of other parents who can share their lived experiences? Can they help or hurt with the shared decision-making process? Hmm. I mean, we, we see that often parents are reaching out to other parents. I mean, there's a clear online community for many parents, uh, which can help them. Uh, at the risk of, I'm just going to be a little bit edgy here, it also can create some trouble for them because uh, there may be some norms or some expectations that could be set up. Um, in other words, the more counselors you have that are giving you different opinions, you have to be prepared that maybe you won't go along with everybody. Um, but that said, I think that parents, because they have walked the walk or a walk that is similar, often are able to help parents think it through and, and feel their way forward. Um, so there's clearly a role for both professional parents, parents who sometimes are hired by the hospital um, to be able to relate to people at a different level. I'll also point out social work, child life, chaplaincy, um, uh, nurses, there's a whole range of people. It's not just the doctors. I'm often the least important person to talk to the parent, that their go-to person might be the chaplain or the child life therapist or the art therapist, and that is fine with me. Do each of your hospitals have parents on staff who you can call to talk to parents? Yes. Yep. Yeah, we do too. Um, it's interesting too because most of the health professionals are also parents. So, what, what, what does it mean to be a designated parent as opposed to an incidental parent? <laughs> uh, well, as we had one audience member happily speak up yesterday saying they were a parent, a designated um, parent. Who, on staff a, parent, a child who had been ill. And as this parent was speaking, I thought, well, you know, there's a ton of people in the room who have been parents, yeah. but we have less claim to have been in the situation, or most of us have been in the situation that we see our patients and families in to have that firsthand experience. But but Chris's point that every experience is different, and when you get the, the families on the web that are supposed to be supporting the family of the child with the same diagnosis and start passing judgments about you know, how what happened with their child might be exactly the same thing going on with this other child when they don't really know the situation. That can that can cause problems, too. I, I yeah. don't know who all, the, who all on the panel has children or doesn't, but <laughs> if you do, do you ever step out of your professional role and <laughs> speak as a parent? 
So you just made an assumption there that stepping out and talking about your child is stepping out of a professional role. I did. <laughs> I, I, I will answer that question in a second, but I'll also point out that I often say you only need to have somebody you love who gets sick and is in the hospital to realize how broken health care is. Mm -hmm. So if I have three healthy children, I don't have the experience of going crazy because the hospitalization experience is crazy making. So I think that there is something about the experience of having somebody, a child, and Lord knows I've had it with my, my parents, um, where you're going through the healthcare system and it is just, even well-run systems are crazy making. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's deep disappointment. So I think that there's a level of the experience that having somebody who's been through that, who can relate to it and say, you're not crazy. It's actually the system that's crazy can be helpful. I do talk occasionally um, about being a father, being the father of three children, um, sometimes also be, be being a husband. Um, again, not to tell people that here I'm an example that you should follow, but to have a, a regular conversation you would about how do you think about the divided duties that you have of you want to be here with your child, you want to also be at home with your other children, you have to work you have these multiple roles that that must be a huge strain on you like how are you coping with that i barely can cope with my fairly healthy existence <laughs> um, so i i think that there's a humanness to all of our lives that if again it's shared um can be an opportunity to talk about the fabric of what we're dealing with um going back to my notion that decision making is about a lot more than just a discrete decision it's about problem solving of facing this adversity that just on and multiple it, fronts and we're hearing a lot about relationship building and trust building and you know finding a way to make a shared decision possible between two people who actually respect each other and maybe even like each other are yeah um need a mic yeah here try this one All right. Um, so I thought it was interesting that um, many of you mentioned going into the room and asking them like how they're doing. Um, and I'm sure in a lot of ways and cases that's good. But what it made me think of is a number of times when I've been to the hospital and I call and I make an appointment and I explain why I'm making an appointment. And I go in and of course the nurse takes you in first, right, without the doctor and you wait another 30 minutes. and. And then the nurse asks me why I'm there. And usually that annoys me because like, I made an appointment for a reason. And second of all, I'm not very comfortable with the nurse. I really don't want to tell them why I'm there. But I tell them. And then, I, you know, I fill out a bunch of paperwork. And then the doctor walks in and asks me why I'm here. And I'm thinking, is anybody listening to me? Like, <laughs> I have just told you why I'm here like six times. And um, I don't know. That's just something I thought of. So Imagine. I think it's always helpful to sort of think what they've been through before you see them because it's probably been like an hour and 20 minutes imagine if it was your 38th hospitalization uh, for the same problem so how do you <laughs> <laughs> I, I i sometimes start out with we're going to run through a lot of questions that you've already answered 18 times already but it's helpful to us to hear it from you directly <laughs> almost apologetically <laughs> It's, uh, it's part of that crazy making <laughs> yeah. experience. Yeah. Of, yeah. Of I, I mean, it's, um, it, I biased in the ICU. Most of the kids have been through an ER and kind of gone through all these different things, but have gone through this resident, fellow, attending ER, all done different H and P's. Um, and if you walk in and you ask a totally different question from the question that everyone else has asked, um, how do you see your child? How has he improved since? They started the treatment in the, in the emergency room. Like they totally had to. They oh, how do I see? I mean, who am I to say? I'm. And then you know, you're you're yeah. part of the team, and it 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 completely it starts the conversation on the right foot. 
and maybe signals that it's not going to be just another rote repetition of the same questions everybody's asked before. Given them. No. Yes, we have more questions coming in. Uh, the second question, uh, I'll set this up by thinking that I think Wynn's paper on titrating decision making might be of relevance to this particular question, which asks, which decisions do you think should be shared on this model, suggesting maybe not all of them should be shared or that maybe they should be shared to different degrees or in different ways? Um, they say all. Um, they specifically mention a case where a family member tried to dictate sepsis treatment, and the physicians felt compelled to share in the decision, which led to a dangerous situation for the patient. Um, so presumably, uh, patient safety and, and uh, a quality outcome might sometimes require <laughs> pushing those voices aside and, and moving ahead without a process of shared decision making. So can you, any of you speak to this, but maybe when particularly? I think what, what we tried to outline was that that directiveness can fall along a, a spectrum as well, and that there may be times that it's necessary because of what the decision is being faced, but also helpful to a family to be more directive, to suggest this might be the best choice, or you know maybe think about this one first versus I'm going to lay out a lot of options on the table, and that there's a range of, and so many factors that play into that that it's hard to predict until you're working your way through those decisions. The, um, I, re I remember one family as well where, you know, they'd been labeled as being difficult or argumentative, which I think is problematic when people start labeling families in that way um, because they wanted to have a hand in every single decision and didn't want to. And the really interesting thing there is they ended up forming a great relationship with one of the ICU attendings who actually said back to them, you know what, these are the decisions you need, me to, you need to let me own, and these are the ones that we will work on together. But this here, this is, you just gotta listen to me. And they respected that. And, um, and you know, they, for that particular attending, they were not a difficult family at all for her. In fact, they requested her you know, months mm -hmm. later. Um, when she was on a different team, like, can she come back? So. Yeah, I was trying to picture what the what the specifics that the questioner had in mind, or maybe whoever wrote that question could. But if somebody said, uh, you know, I don't want my child on a dopamine drip, I want an epi drip. What would you say? <laughs> <laughs> it, it it might. Well, so it <laughs> might depend somewhat on the circumstances, but I probably would be hesitant to, you know, allow a family to make that choice. But I also have to point out that, you know, for some long-term patients whose families have gotten to know them very, very, very well and are there at the bedside every day and the ICU docs are coming in for a day or a week or maybe two weeks at a time, <coughs> that I actually think that their knowledge of that patient at times can be life-saving. And if what that family is saying is, last time that other doctor put them on dopamine that caused major problems mm -hmm. then perhaps we should be listening right um, so, <laughs> so i again i think that that question points out how we conflate everything together but only are thinking about in that question the locus of control who actually is going to control that decision there's plenty of room for sharing information like Wynn is pointing out that parents often have a very they, they are their child's EMR. They're the maternal paternal medical record. They know <laughs> at a level of detail that almost nobody else will what actually has happened the last four or five times. So they're a source of information. I would love to have that shared. They may also have preferences and values um, that one time there was some, say, uh, problems with an infiltrate or whatnot, not exactly the mm -hmm. scenario you're giving. And, we really don't want that to happen again. Don't put the IV in his left arm. Right. I know that that's usually what you do, and that's usually the better way to do it, but it comes with a potential consequence that is anathema to us, so a preference that might be shared. But to say that we're going to then say you can actually write the order, um, you know, I'm going to give you control over the physician aspect, is to put 
us, the physicians, in this very simple, uh, this is where sharing can go too far. I have to act with integrity. And I think that the main point that we have to figure out in all of this locus of control is at what point have you gotten into the red zone of integrity of decision making? Now, often people want to say, well, I should be able to control every single thing. There's reasonable accommodation. But we're now down into this level of a lot of sharing can occur, but who actually is making the call? There are other decisions which are clearly amenable to a lot of uh, the locus of control either being shared or going all the way to the point of the parent making the decision. Until we clean up our concepts of what aspect of this decision-making gemish that we're talking about is being shared, we're going to have questions like this and dilemmas like this because somebody will say, we shouldn't share any of that. Well, that's clearly wrong. We should share all of it, meaning we should entirely, that's wrong. We're not going to be able to make progress until we think about this a bit more clearly and are willing to actually have frank conversations. I want to hear what you have to say. Ultimately, I will have to make the decision. Or in another setting, this will be a decision that if you really don't want it to go forward, I will follow that and we won't go forward. So sort of setting out the ground rules That's as your colleague did. You get to make these. These are mine. And the family said, <laughs> that, that actually, somebody they, gave us They were like, structure. yes, OK. Hey, someone set some limits. Like, yeah. <laughs> right into the next question, which asks, do you have a regular practice of clarifying roles in shared decision-making with families? And I assume maybe in a very explicit, structured way of setting out what the roles would be. And uh, they follow that up with, if yes, do you find this helps in working with family dynamics that can arise, especially with uh, youth with capacity to make healthcare decisions? So, older adolescents, throwing in the uh, team. How do we clarify the roles that they'll play versus their parents versus the clinical staff? <laughs> I was, I was just going to. Um share a, a story when when we first started looking at shared decision making and what parents preferences were and and, and we started seeing that many of them um, uh, there were many more of them that really wanted to own the decision and share the decision but there were a surprising number of, um, of people that also wanted to completely delegate it and um, and so I and my youthful naivete thought this is great I'm learning how to be curious <laughs> I'm learning how to ask questions. I sit down with families and I start to ask them, well, some families like to make decisions this way and some families like to make decisions this way. And I just get blank stares. Just <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> um, and it was very powerful learning experience. And, and, and sadly, this is the way we have often had to learn <laughs> some of these skills that we're talking about is, um, is experiencing them. But um, uh, I think there is uh, a lot more nuance to getting at that answer to those questions. Um, what, what do you think the blank stares meant? That Was it that this kind of question was <laughs> not one? You know, I, I think it, there's so much. You know, talked a lot and many have written about the the overwhelming emotional uh, just overdrive hyperdrive uh, and this uh, to be asked kind of this sort of academic um, um, thing and it, with, with the best of intentions I might add but I mean, what's, <laughs> what, what's, what's funny though is I, I've also found that families are incredibly forgiving when you misstep in your and I'm going a little off topic but um when you misstep a, a a way that you're trying to get at something is um, you can kind of hit a restart and many are incredibly um, um, willing to walk with you there and, and say, oh, okay, um, I, I, I'm sorry, that, that is not exactly how I meant to ask that question. Is it okay if I ask this a different way? <laughs> right. I, I think that uh, I've got a couple of comments, one that has to do with this immediate uh, concern that Vanessa expressed it and, and that you can ask that question if you've established trust. It can't be the first question you ask. So in processes I'm involved with, with parents in the fetal health clinic or in the neonatal unit, or on occasion as an ethics consultant outside of those two environs, I often go to the simple question of how does your family 
deal with difficult decisions? Do you guys sit around the kitchen table and sort of hash things out? Do you call a college girlfriend that you know had a child with a similar condition? How'd she deal with it? Or do you ask your pastor, priest, rabbi to, to come by and, and, and really get some guidance there? But an open explorative only after having established some element of trust. The second comment goes back to the locus of control phenomena. And what I'm also hearing is shared decision making for all of us is like trying to cram a round peg in a square hole. And the square hole is the phenomena of persistent, hierarchical, unchanged power domains in hospitals. Despite family-centered care, despite communication skills classes, why do we perseverate with multiple history and physical questions, as Mara asked? Why do we put parents through something that is not for them or their child? It's truly for us. Medical education hasn't changed a whole lot in the last hundred years. And so we're stuck in these hierarchical, vulnerable versus power wielding um, environs and parents are sensitive to that. And so that I think might be a part of what needs to change to make shared decision making functional. It may be dysfunctional because the, where we put it into operation is not kind and friendly and conducive. Uh, it, it also has to do with where the locus of need for change might be. We might be doing a great job in the particular domain of communication with family, openness, empathy, and uh, deriving trust. But if it's in the wrong environment in the hospital, that in every other way breaks or constrains that, or in the wrong environment in the, the clinic, or uh, you, you name it, uh, it's not going to be as facilitated or perhaps even possible. I wonder if you could speak to that observation. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you put a lot on the table there, Brian. Um, I do want to get back very, very briefly to the question about youth, meaning adolescence. Because I think in the city of Kansas City, where Bill Bartholomew really led the charge of thinking about pediatric ascent, and Bill's one of my heroes in, in thinking about how to be an ethicist, there is, again, a, a wonderful aspect of that and a danger of setting people up to believe by the questions we're asking that they're going to actually be able to have the locus of control. And then if they don't tell you what they you want them to say, they say, well, that's all nice, but we're going to do it anyway. So I am scrupulously careful about setting, before we go and engage a 13, 14, 15-year-old, how much sway are we going to let them have over the decision? And being very clear with them before we start the dialogue about how much control they'll have. I just think that's respectful. If we're not going to ultimately let them determine what's going to happen, I owe it to them to say, okay, let me just start out with where we are. But I do want to hear about what you're scared of, what you're thinking, what you're hoping for. But ultimately, your parents are going to make the decision or they're going to make it in concert with the physicians. Just to be clear on that, uh, I think that you just have to set that very clear. And then I think there are a few thoughts I have very briefly, Brian. One is when I meet people, one of the questions, it won't be the first thing out of my mouth, is how should we work together? Uh, you don't know me. We just... I know you, but you know, if we were simulating this, you know, we're just getting to know each other. You don't know me at all. How can I be helpful to you? Um, I can think of a couple of ways in the past, but you may have a specific feeling about what you want to do. Do you want to talk about things? Do you want to hear my um, the way that I would put together ideas, i.e., the reasoning I have? Um, let's have a discussion now. To make it a little bit academic, there's cognition, then there's metacognition, how we think about thinking. I think there's emotion, and then there's meta-emotion. The feelings that we have about what we're feeling. Should I be ashamed of what I'm thinking uh, You know, outside of that door? Should I be panicking about what I'm feeling? And then we have meta-discussions about relationships. And what we often don't do 
is have a discussion about how are we going to work together. And I, you know, I go in with my badge, but who am I? So I feel like there needs to be a little bit of negotiation about what are you giving me license to do? And again, without dressing it up, like how should we work together? How can I be helpful? I find really open stores, but there's many ways, I, I'm a vegetarian, to peel a potato. You know, I don't believe in skinny cats. So there's many ways to peel a potato. And the question you're asking of how do you typically do it, I think is another way to get at that. How would you want me to potentially participate in this decision making? The last thing is the power hierarchy. Uh, one of the things I think we have to be very clear with people is where are we? So one of the promises or one of the things I say, I'm going to be very straightforward. I'll tell you how worried I'm. I'm not going to make a promise I can't keep. This place has a lot of moving parts, some of which is about hierarchy. Some is just a crazy system. I think being real about some of these issues, I'm not the king of the world. I, I can't control things. All I can do is take what we've talked about and potentially help move it forward. Uh, and I promise you I'll work hard to do that, but I can't promise you what the outcome will be. I think so, we have to, with integrity, reflect the reality you're talking about. So you all wear different professional hats. I mean, sometimes you're the PICU attending, and sometimes you're the palliative care doc. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're the ethics consultant. Do you open the conversation differently if you're walking into the room as the PICU attending? Ab absolutely. How should we work together? <laughs> well, and I, I think getting back to the how should we work together, or what's your preferred decision-making role, you know, I think one reason that's met with blank stares is that might be different depending on what the actual situation we're faced with right now is. You know, my preferred role when I'm overwhelmed and it's our first day in the ICU and I don't even know who all these people are is help me through this. Mm -hmm. And two months later, it's like, you better not screw up like that person last month did. And when I'm just meeting you for the first time, how we're going to work together is very different than two weeks later when I really trust you. And so that, that answer may change. Um, and I do, well, you know, one, of course, introducing oneself as the palliative care um, team in general, you have to be very careful how you feel that, th feel your way through that, what that family has heard, what they need now, what might sound scary, what might not, and, you know, how we get a foot in the door and keep the door open without getting it slammed in our face right from the beginning. Um, and for the ICU attending, it's a little bit different. They're like, all right, this person's running the show. I better listen to them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so different place in there. One of our chaplains told us when they're called to the ER for a trauma, they'll turn their badge backwards. Because for a chaplain <laughs> to show up when your kid's being brought in for trauma mm -hmm. means your kid's dead. Yeah. And Which is not the case. Which is not. So they're right. trying to not send a false signal. Right. So People I will say professionally, if a false signal is being sent, then I agree that they should not be sending it. And it's professionally correct to say, this is just misread. That's not being secretive. It's making sure that there's not misreading. Right. Um, I, and I'm very, very clear. First gasp a moment. Right. And then they explain why and, they're there. Exactly. And then I think to echo what Wynn is saying, I have to be very clear about what role I'm inhabiting when I engage families. Am I coming in as a physician? Am I coming in as the ethics consultant? They're radically different. If I'm coming in as the palliative care physician or a complex care physician, uh, I tend to think that my starting point is basically the same. How can I be of help? And then after a little bit of discussion, I start to clarify the team that I am working with and some of the things that we might be able to offer where I really then flesh out how those two teams can help in different ways. Uh, this will probably be the last question, but I think this is a, this is a great question to end with. Um, and I'll frame it this way. Um, I'm going to combine two questions, actually. Um, a lot of what we've been talking about are sort of idealized cases where maybe the parents are on the same page and they come from a different way <laughs> and they are used to sharing in decisions in various ways. But what do we do in cases where, say, parents vastly disagree about what should happen in the course of this? And so you now have additional parties to the conversation and the, and the sharing process. Or what do you do with people from different cultures who may not have any familiarity with this and may sort of come from a model of, I just come to you as the expert and you tell me what to do and they, they resist even the sort of slightest attempts to include them in a substantive way. So 
if anyone wants to pick up on either of those kinds of non-ideal cases. And do it in the remaining two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Myra Blue Blonde Langer has a wonderful concept of shuttle diplomacy, which is that I would embody the role if the two parents are on different pages of if they can talk together, that's the best way to do it and, and help them potentially hash out. But if they really are, are so... Um, distraught by the fact that they're not on the same place. They may have a hard time doing that. So there is a shuttling back and forth to try to see, as a negotiator would, is there a way to bring the parties together? We sometimes do shuttle diplomacy also between you know, the medical team and the family or between even members of the medical team. Um, this goes back, the second point, to the, the issue about autonomy. If people say, I don't want to do this, this is where I think bioethics has to get its mind wrapped around. Is that the exercise of autonomy? Or is that an inappropriate delegation that you're, is somehow an illegal move? And I tend to think it ought to be respected as an act of autonomy. Anybody else? I, I would just say when I see parents that are on such different pages, sometimes I think my role is to just slow things down to see if I can help them work something out together and preserve their relationships. Now, sometimes the child being ill is only bringing out things that were going to come out at some point. I remember one mother telling me after she got divorced, after her child de died, I said, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, that happens to so many families. And she goes, oh, no, we would have gotten divorced 10 years earlier if she, you know, hadn't been in our lives. I was like, oh, <laughs> which made me think about that data differently. But the, but how do you help this fan, you know, don't pit them against each other. You know, any any conflict that's going to be there, you shouldn't be adding to it. Cody? <laughs> Just <clears throat> remember that conflict is often a defense against grief. Anger is a defense against grief. So it's very important, again, that the doctor's mind is cleared, or the nurse or social worker has a clear mind and can go in and receive that anger and be receptive to it and hold it until the person can feel what's really underneath it. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, doing this on the first day of ASBH here in Kansas City. It's going to be a great meeting. I hope uh, everybody has fun, and uh, people who want to who are in town, stop by our reception tomorrow evening, 5.30 to 7.30 at Milano in Crown Center, and tune in October 30th when Dom Wilkinson is going to come all the way from Oxford, England, to talk about the Charlie Guard case. Bye-bye.